Um, welcome to uh, the New Hampshire Tech Crawl, the technology behind the brewing industry. So as I said, my name is Lindsay Coates and I'm the Senior Associate Director of Career and Life Planning and I'll be your host today um, and hopefully effective moderator. <laughs> so this part of the Tech Crawl is all about networking and seeing yourself in a role using technology. And we've explored technology and how it's used in different industries. And right now we're joined by an amazing panel of brewing industry professionals. So we wanna hear what questions you have. Um, the chat function is up and running. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask. We already have a, a list of questions that, um, that we have uh, gotten from, um, that we'd like to hear about. Um, that, and we also want to, um, they're gonna be about uh, our brewers professional pathway, how they've used technology within their position and also all importantly, because this is a networking event, any networking, professional, or application tips that they've picked up along their way. So this is definitely your chance to ask questions. So please put um, all questions in the chat and Megan Brandau um, and Shannon Sharia will moderate um, and uh, break in and ask questions as well. So directory, di directly after this panel, we'll switch gears with following up. Um, networking next steps will we chat about how now you have all these great contacts and how do I follow up with them. Um, so I want to um, offer a very, very, very warm welcome to our guests from all across the country. Um, start out with if you want to give, uh, make sure you're, give a, give a quick wave as I introduce you. Um, uh, David Currier, the owner of the Henniker Brewing Company. So give a wave, thank you. And I wish we had smell a vision so we could smell your pipe because it's, it's pretty fantastic. And next, uh, Judy Clark, who is the quality control man manager at Smutty Nose Brewery. And um, next we have CJ White, who's the executive director of the New Hampshire Brewers Association. You wanna give a wave? Hello, welcome. And last but not least, we have alumna Jennifer Radish um, from the class of 08, um, who's the quality control lab tech and analytical lead from Breckenridge Brewery. Can I give a wave? Welcome. So let's start out with a quick um, introduction um, and tell me a little bit about your role and how you, how you came into this role. David, would you like to start? Well, I, it kind of haphazardly, I got involved with a, a number of kids who were uh, wanting to go into business. And uh, uh, a small, I'm a, on the board of a small Catholic college in Warner, New Hampshire. And uh, so we were throwing things against the wall to see what would stick. And because I had my old Boundary Medical building that was going to be available. And somehow, long story short, the academic dean's son at the college who had retired uh, his his uh, son and his wife at that they're divorced now, but anyway, uh, started Tuckerman's Brewery. So we went up and made a visit there, and it was all downhill from there. Thank you, Jennifer. Would you like to tell us your story and and start off like even in at, at NAC because I know you started you were a biology major. So how did you how did your pathway? Um, go after after uh, college. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I graduated in 2008. Um, I was a varsity hockey and lacrosse player. Um, so made my way out west to Denver. Um, originally thought I wanted to go into PT, so I was looking into physical therapy school and things like that. And moving to Denver, which is a huge craft beer mecca, as I feel like most of you know. Um, I realized that I could use my degree and go into brewing quality um, and kind of been there ever since and love it and been kind of moving my way up learning and using tech and all that to make better beer. So how, do, how, does, the, how does the tech part um, factor in? How do you, just to kind of drill down into that a little bit. Yeah, so most breweries, larger breweries especially, have automated brew houses. Um, so it runs on a lot of proprietary software based on the brew house. Um, and then depending on the brewery, again, you can have everything automated all the way through the system. Um, in quality specifically, we use a program called Smartsheet um, to help us kind of compile all of our data, create charts, um, fermentation curves, things like that, so that we can 
track every fermentation and make sure we're making consistent beer. Um, there's also a, um, I think it's a love-hate relationship everyone has with a software called Orchestrated Beer. Um, so we use that as well. That's more of like the inventory side and the scheduling and the, the financial end of it. Um, so there's a lot of tech kind of all the way through, including instruments within the lab and throughout the brewery. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. CJ, would you like to introduce yourself and your role? Hello, everybody. I am uh, the executive director of the New Hampshire Brewers Association. And what that means is I work with over 80 breweries in the state, um, from all of their legislative to their marketing to events and coordination, as well as education um, for all of them. And I started I actually came from the outdoor industry and the closest industry to outdoor is actually beer in my world because um, you, you can only do things outside and then have a beer after. So it was a natural transition for me to kind of progress into that. Um, so I came from product designing and uh, management for Eastern Mountain Sports um, a few years ago and then I shifted over to become the executive director. That's, that's really cool. I think, yeah, I, then that was kind of going to be one of my questions, my follow-up questions about how, like what different skills you've used, but yeah, I'd love to, for you to talk, talk more about that. Um, oh, last year was a, a, an interesting one because we went yeah. completely virtual on everything we had to do as an association, so. <laughs> I, I feel like this year has been innovation central. Yep. <laughs> Judy, how about you? Um, so I uh, have a degree in chemistry. I graduated from St. Lawrence University in 97, um, and I worked at uh, Dow Chemical in Nashua for a little while and then went on to grad school but wasn't super psyched to be there. Um, so I was talking with a group of friends over dinner one night in a bar of all places and just uh, thinking about what we should, what I should do and what my next step should be. And I have a passion for beer. So it just seemed to fit chemistry and beer. So that's how I ended up at Smutty Nose. I uh, did the American Brewers Guild online program and then uh, set up an inter internship through them and have been with Smutty Nose ever since. So that's one of the things that, um, could you tell me a little bit more about the, um, that professional organization? Because we're talking to students about like what other ways that they can network and how, so tell me a little bit about how you found that, that professional organization helpful. Um, well, it was actually an online course that went through all of brewing. And then we did about a week out in uh, Sacramento, California uh, at Hoppy Brewing Company um, and learned some real life skills there. Um, and then um, as an organization, it's, it's more of a, a school type, educational uh, type thing. Uh, you end up with a certificate at the end of it. At the time, because um, this was years and years ago, uh, there wasn't a lot of different universities that were offering these types of programs. So UC Davis would have been your big one here in the state. Um, maybe Siebel in, um, in Chicago, and that's probably, and then the American Brewers Guild. But now you'll find courses everywhere. So including NEC, yeah. NEC, <laughs> so, uh, so it's really fortunate that it's that much more accessible to people to be able to get into this field. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of biology and chemistry and physics and engineering and all that stuff that goes into making beer. It's not just putting water in a vessel and hoping for the, for the best, you know? So. Absolutely. You know, I, I actually, um, I went to UC Davis for my master's and, you know, we, the viviculture class would be, you know, very, people got a bit of a rude awakening because they thought it was all sort of, you know, just yeah. trying wine, but no, no, no. <laughs> There's no. a lot more that goes into it. Yeah. So we have our first question in the chat and anybody um, feel free to pop in with this. So I'm wondering what the panelists may have noted as a skills gap in the industry. So this is a great one. Um, what students should be, what, what should interested students or young professionals make sure they're building um, up their knowledge of? I 
can tackle some of this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, being somebody that interacts with uh, breweries on a daily basis, I also don't just deal with New Hampshire. I actually engage with pretty much all of New England and nationally. So I'm part of the National Association for the Brewers. Um, and what we find is that if, for example, in New Hampshire, we have what we call a little bit of a lag um, as far as educational resources um, for our industry specifically. And it doesn't mean that there aren't actual practicums that you can do as, for example, what Judy had, has done. Um, it's more that the pool of people here don't have the experience of that. So when it comes to there being a hole, for example, uh, a brewery that's in need of a brewer or a quality manager or all of that, we don't have a large enough pool in our state to necessarily pull from. To So we have to kind of seek outside of New England and more nationally, which is always a trivial thing to have to do, especially if you're asking somebody to move across the country for a position in New Hampshire. But um, so I would encourage people to, as you kind of progress throughout the industry, is to make sure that you're continuing your education um, and look at opportunities also outside of your state. Great, thank you. Any other tips as far as like things that they see in your in your breweries, how you, and alternately, like if even if you're not, um, let's say, you know, um, let's say you're not a brewer or haven't haven't gone to school for that. What other types of op job opportunities exist um, within the brewing industry? Well, there's all the all of his obviously all of the financial you know aspects of it. We, in fact, we have an internship program with New England College, which is kind of like died on the vine right now because of COVID. But we we've, we've had two or three, maybe even four or five uh, interns in the course of a 12 month period. Um, where students come and get a feel for the finance side of it. Uh, we also uh, have done things uh, in the marketing area, the retail area of it, to learning the, uh, the operation of a tap room, and so on and so forth. But the, the, I think the key word in terms of the first question is you need really a passion for beer. And it, and it has to shine out uh, in an interview that you, uh, um, you know, not that you have a lot of, you know, knowledge of the brewing business unless you've been a home brewer or something, but passion is, is the word I hear all the time. I would agree with Dave that it's a cultural thing. Um, so the brewing community is just that. It's a community of people and it's kind of, if you equate it to another industry, I always go back to outdoor. It's kind of like, you ha you know who the hikers are, you know who the bikers are, you know, you know all those different things. And so when it comes to craft beer, there's definitely a craft beer drinker and a non-craft beer drinker. But with regard to passion, it also is more, you have to kind of know the nuances of what the industry is and some of the language. And uh, unfortunately that means you often have to keep up with social media and a bunch of different apps, but, um, as Dave suggested, there's there's a wide breadth of things because a lot of people have the misconception that breweries are just those businesses that brew beer. At the end of the day, they're still a business. They need an accounting department, an HR department, a marketing department, a creative department, website design. They need all of that legal, all of that stuff still happens as it is a small business. Um, so you can find yourself enjoying beer at lunch on your lunch break while also looking through HR or dealing with QuickBooks. <laughs> yeah, and I would say from a quality perspective specifically, um, now that I'm in it, food safety, um, HACCP, things like that, those kind of cer certifications that you can get outside of college um, are important on the quality end. Um, beer, Quality and safety is very similar to the food industry. Um, thankfully, beer pretty much can't kill anyone because we don't have any foodborne pathogens, thankfully. Um, so a little less stressful, but still same, same idea um, with the food safety and the HACCP end of things. The other is the Cicerone program, which you, you can get as a beer server, but it also progresses. So as you start to try different styles of beer, it's actually, 
an interesting model to kind of like know more about each of the styles and grow within it um, and get those certifications through that program as well. Yeah, so you never stop learning, right? <laughs> what were you going to say, Judy? There's a couple others that I would uh, add to the list. Um, wastewater being a big important one for even the smaller breweries now because most towns are, and their public wastewater treatment facilities can't handle the load that brewing adds to that. So if anyone has any interest in that, then that's definitely a place to go. Um, also, tech, uh, the IT department, often you'll find small breweries don't have an IT person and we hire out and that can be troublesome um, because you have to wait till they're available. Um, and maintenance, electricians, all of those things um, are certainly good places to go to if that is of any interest. Yeah, the, speaking of wastewater, um, we partner with the Department of Environmental Services, and they even have grant programs that deal with brewing, and we've kind of helped them kind of keep them going um, on pollution and various things and uh, efficiencies at the breweries, so that's another whole avenue to explore, too. Just to piggyback off of Judy's comment, in breweries, especially small ones, if you're a brewer, you're probably also cellaring and filtering beer and packaging beer. You're wearing a lot of different hats. So the more you can learn across all uh, departments in the brewing process, if you wanna be a, an actual brewer or work in production um, would be incredibly helpful. That's just, you know, I think one of the things that we do is, you know, helping students get, uh, find out what they're interested in and find out which direction to go to. Because quite often our students have like so many choices that it, narrowing it down can be, can be helpful. So it sounds like it really what Dave was saying, what all of you say is like that passion of, you know, if, if you find something that you're interested in, probably you're going to have some role within it. And it's about finding, matching your skills to to whatever kind of industry you might be interested in. And I think we have our second, um, how, our second question of how is the tech in tech, how, excuse me, um, how is tech being used or not being used um, if, if products are being determined internally from the brewing passion to determine what types of products, oh, will be well received by customers. So how do you, how do you figure out what the, is it like maybe a trend or what is going to be that next uh, beer that you brew? So I guess I can speak to Breckenridge. Um, we have our head brewer, our quality manager, um, our founder and CEO. Um, they and a few other people that make the decisions on what we brew um, get together kind of every Friday and they drink competitor beers and they see what's out there, see what's what tastes good, um, you know, what people are liking. Um, there's also an aspect of market research, and to be completely honest, I don't know who does that here, but someone does. Um, but there's definitely an aspect of market research to that and, and what's seeming to sell out in the market. Um, I think our director of sales looks at a lot of that um, and will kind of lead our production accordingly. That's great. Yeah. How, any other thoughts about market research and how that's done? The Brewers Association, which is a national organization, they have a wealth of information. Bart Watson is the man of all stats you could possibly ever need to know or not expect that you ever needed to know about beer. Um, he is their chief economic um, person there, and he just goes on, he, he watches the trends, but he also looks to see from the consumer standpoint outside of beer what's going on and those influences that come back to beer. So it's not, it, he looks at wine and spirits, but he also looks at like earlier last year, we saw, he reported that there's a downturn in Le Levi denim sales because everyone was on Zoom because no one had to wear pants. So it was like these random things that he can tell you that influence the buying decisions, but he uses data and um, data mining to get all of that information. Yeah, one of, one of the interesting things is, is that, you know, coming up with a style of beer, um, one of the things that uh, 
customers that have been coming into the brewery tap room have uh, kind of patted us on the back as is that we have a very, very good variety of beers on tap from stouts to lagers uh, to our core brands and so forth. And we're always coming out with and or re-releasing, you know, brands that have uh, come out and uh, uh, over the course of the year and we reintroduce them once a year. For example, we've been getting calls since November about our King Misanthrope. Well, because of the can shortage, we've been putting all of our cans into basically our core brands to keep the market baskets and like Hannaford's and all those places um, uh, supplied with the beers. Uh, and, and so like, I mean, I have a million, can you believe this? A million cans on order right now. And I have no idea when the next 12 ounce truckload is coming. And so I've had to actually buy uh, on the open market cans that have cost me twice as much as I was paying from buying them directly from Crown. So it's interesting. But it, the other thing is, is that the style of beer um, at it, 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 uh, it Henneker Brewing um, doesn't determine anything in terms of the marketing aspects of it from this term of a name um, you know, what the, um, what do they call it? Facsimile name that the ETB uses that, um, this, this, they want to know the style obviously, but, but, uh, you know, whatever uses a facsimile name, like for example, we had an interesting thing happen uh, to a release that we did, um, a couple months ago, which was called Red Scooter. Well, what that, what the, the type of beer that, I'm, I'm trying to think of what style it was, but anyway, I, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, it was an so, IPA. Huh? It was an IPA. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, the story behind that was we had a red scooter that was sitting here on top of my snow machine trailer inside the building uh, being stored. And it happened to be an NEC student who decided he was going to go to graduate school. I think he has his doc. He's working on his doctorate now at UNH, and uh, so he's uh, he 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 left this red scooter because his brother was working here as, as the finance director at the time. And um, Paul came to me and said, "Hey, can I can can my brother Joe leave his uh, his scooter here? And you know, because he's going to school over at UNH and doesn't have a place to put it." And so I said, "Yeah, well." Four years later, it became the name of our beer. And as soon as we released that beer, his brothers and him came and picked up the Red Scooter. And the Red Scooter is famous now. But it's a 100% it's a effort on the part of all of our employees to help come up with the names um, and the design uh, of the labels for, for the beer. And it, it's kind of, it gets exciting because it's it, it just uh, like the story about the red scooter. I mean, who would have had the fun? That's such a great point, Dave. And I think that for so many of our students um, who are in the audience today, we have a lot of graphic designers. And so to that point, um, you know, what kind of culture is it like at your respective organization? I think we have a lot of folks that are interested in hearing feedback on this particular question. This is one that we've gotten quite frequently. Yeah. Well, and I'm a though, big red scooter fan, so there's yeah. that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's kind of interesting because, like, you know, we run this business like a family, and nobody's related. Although we did have three Daves here at one point, which was very confusing. Um, but we now we're down to one Dave, me, and um, but anyway, so we run it like a family. So as a culture, you know, it you know everybody knows each other and. Uh, uh, there, are, there are groups of people who, within the company that do things together and stuff. And, and so it's, it's a very homey kind of culture, I think, at least at Hanukkah Brewing it is. And, I, and I, I get a sense from other breweries that it's basically the same type of thing. Although the bigger you get, the more corporate you get kind of thing. And, you know, those decisions are made at a board level or a corporate level, whereas, you know, we kind of make our decisions uh, collectively here. That's great. Let's hear from Jennifer. I saw you unmuted yourself. I've never had the pleasure pleasure of going up to Breck, but I'd love to hear from you. 
Yeah, so I guess I can speak to the uh, the corporate side of things. So Breckenridge Brewery is one of the craft breweries that Anheuser-Busch InBev purchased, um, I think about four or five years ago. Um, and like Dave was saying, breweries are very family feel, um, especially at the smaller ones. You're doing pretty much every job in the brewery. So everyone learns to really work together. Um, I've only been here for about two and a half years, um, but it's definitely still that way here. Breckenridge started at the pub up in Breckenridge, um, and then they came down into Denver and they've moved to a few different facilities as they got bigger and bigger and eventually got bought. Um, but it's still that same feel. Everyone's, you know, helping each other out and, and trying to solve problems together and hanging out, going over to the tap room after work and grabbing a beer and you know, the typical brewery culture. We're lucky that Anheuser-Busch does not, yes, we have some of the corporate stuff um, that we have to follow more on the legal end, um, but they pretty much just let us do what we want. We can brew what we want. We can put out what we want. We have some small batch stuff that we can do, especially with the pub up in Breckenridge. They, uh, they do a lot of our fun, really small, small batch things that are one-time release only. So um, the corporate stuff, I, I kind of like the corporate stuff. I'm someone who likes a lot of organizations. So in that aspect, I do enjoy it. Um, so I think it kind of all depends on what kind of person you are. And, and that is the nice thing about being under the AV umbrella is that we get their resources, but they don't really strong arm us into doing what they tell us. Um, one thing that I'll touch on that you mentioned earlier is that the biggest uh, hole that I see, aside from having enough brewers for all the breweries in our state from time to time, is that as an association, I do a lot of events and I have to look for graphic designers. And there is a big disparity between how many are actually out there that do beer in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and there's very few that I can go to, to actually create an event poster, create the beer trail, all of that stuff. Um, and there are businesses that are booming out kind of in the Midwest and the California area specifically as well, that all they focus on is designing craft beer can labels and they do it extremely well. And it makes it so much easier um, on the brewery to not have to come up with the idea or ha hire a graphic designer if they can hire out for it. Whereas, yes, they can conceptualize what they want the beer to be named and what's the image, but it goes a lot further as if you can be the person from a graphic designing standpoint to help foster the brand. Whereas the brand has to carry through not only the beer, but it has to carry through in the story um, as well as the marketing aspect of the brewery. And so, if you're considering anything with graphic design, I would strongly encourage you. It's probably more than likely more freelance stuff, but it is stuff that will get your name out there. Um, and we have the need for that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I would, oh, sorry, Lindsay. No, go on, go on. I, I was just going to ask a, a little bit more about the, the culture. I think that that's something that's really, really cool. It sounds like you guys are like a small knit community, if you will. And I, you know, I think that really resonates with, um, you know, a, a student like someone that's at New England College because it is such a small tight knit community uh, on our campus as well. So you can kind of see how that bridge would be gapped if they got into uh, your field. So I, I guess my question is, uh, when someone comes to interview with you folks, what type of questions or what do you look for um, that kind of tells you that this person is going to be a good fit and fits in, and fits your culture? One and a half to drink beer. <laughs> what was that? Uh, I said one, they should probably be able to drink beer um, and enjoy drinking beer. Uh, but I think the other thing is, is that when you get to the nitty gritty of what happens behind the scenes and both Jennifer and Judy and David kind of talked about this is that you look for somebody that's multifaceted. Um, so although you can be the marketing person for the brewery, you're also might potentially be the person that has to help uh, do the canning day. Um, so you have to have the ability to adapt 
and modify on a daily basis. Um, and especially after everything that happened with COVID, you'll see that a lot of breweries had to transition and did their best to hang on to the employees they did have, but that meant that they also had to pivot because you are a mom and pop kind of environment where it's like, you could be the accounting person, but now you're also gonna have to be the one that's pouring beer out front if you want the survival of this small business. <clears throat> if you have the mindset to do that and you can create the initiative to learn every aspect of what goes on in the brewery, it creates and fosters not only the family environment, but the team environment. And that is what furthers the culture. And if you can get that to echo through all the way down to your branding, and the story you're telling to the consumer, it resonates that that's what you're, what you are. It, it's like, it's not just the beer, it's the people that make the beer, it's the people who are sharing the beer together. And that's really what establishes the culture and maybe some really cool graphics. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because, um, you know, flexibility in an interviewing process, you know, somebody who was just focused on the numbers, if they were, if you were hiring somebody in the accounting area, or the analytical area, uh, you know, it's one thing, but I mean, I didn't know anything about making beer before I got into this, but I, you know, I know a lot more than I ever did. I still have a lot more to learn, but the thing is, is that my finance guy yesterday was out catching cans. I come off a canning line at 40 cans a minute, you know, so he needs more than a little bit of flexibility to, to be able to uh, accommodate that. But, you know, some, some people have got a mindset that I'm going to be a bean counter and that's what I'm going to do. Well, in, in this type of an operation, you could be cleaning the bathrooms or fixing a plug in the septic system because Unlike a municipality septic system that a lot of breweries are on, even though there are major issues there, because you can impact that that septic, uh, not the septic system, but the uh, sewer treatment plant by you know dumping yeast and and all kinds of things in there, and it it throws their whole chemistry completely off. And then they come up and tell you uh, you can't do that anymore. You know, there were breweries in New Hampshire that because they're on the far end of the brewery system, it gets all flowed in and filtered in between the time it goes into the, the original dumping station at the brewery till it gets into the treatment facility. And so, you know, you, you could be unplugging something like that uh, or, or a toilet or anything. I mean, there's no job here that even I do. Um, the other thing that I will say is that what I tend to see a lot and hear from a lot of breweries is that there's certain people that tend to want to find the latest and greatest new tool that's going to save whatever they're doing and it's going to make everything easier for them, more efficient for them. But the reality of that is, is when it comes down to it, your employees and the culture that you create have to be the resource to be like have the intuition and the aptitude to just figure it out and not rely on the new latest greatest thing to get you through. Um, and I hear it a lot from some people that are like, oh, well, if I just get this new software, if I just get this new app, it'll make it so it's way more efficient and we can do all this. But at the end of the day, you still have to learn those things and you don't have a lot of time to waste on learning necessarily new ways of doing things when it comes to technology sometimes. And so the other thing is, is that a lot of the owners, sorry, Dave, I'm not going to throw you under the bus, but you <laughs> probably think I am. Um, technology isn't their strong suit. So it's like Judy said, you know, we, we often hear that people are looking for IT people and stuff, but it's also, that's not going to solve the issue. It's still everything still has to happen. So there has to be a balance between those two things where. Yeah, technology is a crazy thing because like we just migrated to micro, what is it, micro, Windows 365 or something the other day. And, you know, I have an, <laughs> I have an iPhone 5, but I can do things on this iPhone 5 that anybody else can do on these these new later greater models. But the thing is, is that every time they update and upgrade something, they change something in its location. They call it a different thing. 
And having people um, on your staff that has some background in those kinds of technologies is, is obviously very important. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, Judy, you had mentioned um, a software um, that sounded a little bit like Excel, like so maybe students can take, you know, take a, a program like Excel and then build upon it that, and like a transferable skill. Um, is that to an industry specific software? Is, does that sound fair? Um, yeah, I, there are a few industry specific softwares out there that uh, like orchestrated beer would be one of them. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of different QC ones in particular. Um, but yeah, most of what I do, I, I manipulate my own Excel spreadsheets and we've got a, an Excel guru on staff. So uh, any problems we have with uh, weird equations and stuff like that, you know, we can get those worked out. So we're not using any specific software at this time other than uh, Draft Lab for sensory stuff uh, for the QC side of things. Uh, which is a really cool app. Um, it allows you to go through um, and taste different beers. You can set up tastings and stuff like that. So um, it's really neat to get into the sensory side of things and make it a little bit easier for, for me in particular, because I'm a lone person in the department that it just is less time for me to manipulate the data. So that's, um, that's why we opted to use that program. So. Yeah, it's, it's everything is, you know, I think, I think technology is one of those things, as David said, that there are always new versions that are coming out, yeah. but um, Excel has been one of those ones that that is actually, um, for all the students out there, Excel is understanding the formulas and understanding Excel is, is probably one of the most asked for, um, I think it is the most asked for um, uh, skill or technology um, on job descriptions. So across every industry, everywhere. Um, so know your Excel. <laughs> I will say that Excel is the most, um, from broad ranging, it comes from like the QC department, from finance department, but it also like, it's where brewers will do their calculations. It's also where you do production. You have to, you can also use Excel to lay out your um, marketing strategy and calendars in there. And it all can kind of work together. But I feel like Excel is one of those things that often intimidates a lot of people. Um, but I use it nearly every single day. And I've, I will also say I get really great at using uh, Google Docs and Google Drive because all of that information has to be shared because when you're dealing, for example, most of my information I have to share across with boards as well as members. So everything has to be hyperlinked for me to be able to do that. Whereas I can't necessarily just send a Word document. It doesn't do any good when you're trying to reach 300 people. Um, so I have to have it all linked and it has to be an essential area for me to do that. Um, so. And a lot of stuff on Excel translates to Google Docs. We use a program called Smartsheet, which is very similar to Google Docs and Excel. Um, it's web-based as well. Um, it's a little bit more of kind of like a product or project management system, um, but we've been able to make it work for us. And um, so being good at all of those things helps you. At a brewery, I mean, we have a lot of calculators that we use for, you know, cell counts and pitch rates and things like that. And we util utilize spreadsheets for all of that. So you don't have to know the calculations all the time. You don't have to know the formulas. You can just pop into a spreadsheet that's been saved, enter the information and get the number. Um, so being good with those is definitely helpful. Hey, are people using the chat function? Let's see, I am, um, people are, um, there are questions that are, I'm, I'm monitoring that. So we haven't had a question in a little bit, but. Just well, my, my, my question is, is uh, are, the, are the other people on the thing and the only people can talk are on the screen? Um, so anybody can pipe in and talk. Um, so that's, that's totally fine. So students and, and anybody can, can either put questions in the chat or, or chat. 
Um, so right, but is it the eighteen people that are showing up on the screen, or are there yes. hundred, are there two hundred people want elsewhere? Nope. Nope, they're oh, just okay. 18. Yeah, okay. yeah, and then we'll use yeah. this. Um, and because I, I, I wasn't sure if Greg Palmer was asleep or not, because <laughs> he, he wasn't sure. His the 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 glare from the the light off of his top of his head was. was <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> Dave! Dave, I am officially here. Thank you for the call out. I've been reserving <laughs> all of my extremely extensive craft beer knowledge for the other guests. Yes. Because I know that you and I talk beer every time we get together. Are you drink? Are you drinking a Hopslinger right now? I, I right now, unfortunately, I do have a uh, a Woodstock in pint glass, but it's just <laughs> water, no hops and barley in this one, Dave. I love the Woodstock in, and I also want to introduce um, John Wyatt and uh, Marlena Tremblay. They are um, our employer partners uh, and co-hosts for for this afternoon. And we're gonna roll into just a couple of questions about networking next steps. So we wanted to pick everybody's brain. Hi, John, hi, Marlena. Um, thanks for joining us. So we just wanna um, increase the panel a little bit and ask questions about um, either the, you know, Shannon had a great one about, um, uh, about the application process. You know, I'm curious to hear like, what are some, you know, the, the resume is oftentimes one of the um, first things that, that you'll see as an employer when you have a new, um, a, a, you know, looking for a new hire. Are there some do's and don'ts that you like to see? Yeah, okay. CJ, go right ahead. <laughs> um, one of the biggest things that I will tell you is if you're applying at a brewery, do not send just a generic resume. And if you're writing and if it asks for a cover letter, they literally mean send me a cover letter in addition to your resume. Um, I can't tell That's, you. Yeah, that is very, 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 very key. Follow the directions. Yes. Um, and when you're, at, when you're writing your cover letter, don't make it just a blanket cover letter that you'd send to all the people you're employing. Tell them why you're interested in beer because the first question you're going to get asked in the interview is why do you like beer? What's your history with beer? What's your passion for beer? Tell me what your favorite beer is. Um, I can't ever tell you that because I would have 80 breweries look at me <laughs> upside down and say, what about mine, CJ? Um, but those are things that you need to consider in the application process is even if you don't have a background in the industry, the cover letter is where you can tell your story as to why you think you'd fit in there. But also, even if it's just a hobby for you at the moment or something you want to be more passionate about, um, during the interview, express that. Uh, I think if you can say, oh, well, I've tried 300 beers I use on tap to whatever it is that you're using to like share the experience, the more that you can convey that you actually have enthusiasm for beer um, and not just saying, oh, I drink on Fridays and I drink a 30 pack. Like nobody wants to hear that. They want to know, like, do you know the difference between a German Pilsner or an IPA? Or do you know the difference between like a Bach and we'll say a Saison? Um, and those are kind of next level of depth um, so if you can go into that, and the other thing that I will tell you is do your homework before you apply, meaning look at the company's website, look at where you can buy the beer, go try the beer, look at the brand, look at all of that stuff before you actually apply for the brewery to see if you think you'd, one, fit there, but also share it like, I like Hopslinger. I'm so glad it's one of my favorite beers to bring on a hike. Share your story and your engagement with the beer as well. Thank you, such helpful information. We actually have a, a uh, changing gears a little bit, um, a great question about why are IPA styles so popular? What changed that these became market dominators from my experience? A lot of them don't taste like beer. <laughs> I had to say it. Sorry. <laughs> they definitely are. In fact, the more eyes in the IPA, the more, you know, when there's a differentiation by a D, so it's a double IPA, they're, they're more than popular now. 
and, and I mean, because there are a lot of people out there that don't like hoppy beers. And that's why when I mentioned earlier that some of our, uh, you know, customers, when they came in, they love the fact that we have such a variety of beers on tap. Um, so they get to ch try other, you know, other varieties of beer than just the IPAs. There was, a question be, there was a question before that that was more technical that maybe Jennifer or Judy could answer. Well, one thing I want to add to the IPA, uh, part of the reason that they grew in popularity is that they take seemingly the least amount of time to turn over. So if you're lagering beer, that usually takes a longer period. So like a Pils or a Kolsch or anything like that that uses lager yeast takes it, it has to sit and ferment and like sit in the tank for a longer period where some people can turn around an IPA. The turnover time is, is shorter by weeks um, for some. Oh, that's and, fascinating. And, and, yeah, in some cases, months. Wow. Oh, and um, Dave, I think, Megan, do you want to ask that question that... Uh, the the very silly one. one. Yes, but um, just out of curiosity for the, for the sake of our students, um, what kinds of industry specific questions can a candidate expect to be asked? Is it as simple as what's your favorite beer? Or like you said, what's the difference between a Kolsch and an IPA? Well, if you actually know that the answers to those kind of questions when you get asked them, that's a bonus for you because I mean today I'm still having struck I've been in the business eight years already when we got our license there was 17 breweries and now there's a, 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 over 100 in New Hampshire so and and I still don't know the answer to some of those questions because they're very technical things but your your chemist here may know some specifics about that yeah, I would hope to not be asked that question specifically, <laughs> um, because I too do not know the difference. I have not gone through my Cicerone. Um, Cicer so I think CJ mentioned the Cicerone certification earlier. Um, it's essentially a beer sommelier course, I guess is the way you could um, describe it. And it, it goes up and up in levels um, as you, I think there's four or five levels of it. Um, and by the end, you should be able to recite the ABV, the IBUs, the color range, everything that uh, defines a style off the top of your head, and I am not there. Um, I could read it in a book and tell you, but um, so I hope that it's more along the lines of what's your favorite beer? I think it all depends on what you're applying for specifically. Um, obviously, the questions are going to be a little bit different if you're applying to be the accountant versus a brewer. Um, and I think your experience level. When I got into, I started at Avery Brewing Company in Boulder. Um, and when I had my interview, I had never worked in beer before. Um, I didn't really know what it was all about. And thankfully they, you know, gave me a shot and I've learned everything I know throughout, you know, the last four or five and a half years or so. Um, so I think for the most part, you can expect to be asked things like, you know, are you flexible? What would you do in this situation if something seemed to go wrong or um, questions about your attention to detail? Um, beer is a living thing. It is fermented with yeast, which is a living thing. Um, so things can go wrong whether we want them to or not. Um, and we always have to be able to pivot and catch that and, and try and fix it. Um, so I think those would be my biggest things in an interview. That's great. And like after an interview, um, oh, sorry, my sound is a little weird. Um, after an interview, um, there's, there's always sort of a question about thank you notes. And we always encourage at career and life planning people to, to write thank you notes and to, and to follow up. Um, do you prefer email um, or is the hard copy um, like an actual thank you note um, better? What is your preference? email yeah i i don't personally hire people in my position um but in the positions that i have gotten i've always sent it um, digitally in an email so and that seems to have always worked that's awesome and and how how long is there i mean i know that how long did you wait until you sent that and, and what kind of information did you put in there 
I know we're getting granular, but these kind of things it, it are depend, It depends on what office I was running for. <laughs> I've gotten a few uh, shortly after the interview, pretty much after um, the student had left, uh, just saying thank you for my time. For my time, and it was nice for you uh, to see your facility and appreciate all of your insight. That kind of stuff, like, it doesn't have to be anything over the top. But it, I think a thank you note, especially these days, goes a really long way because. I think we're losing a little bit with uh, too much social media and everything and just that interpersonal connection between people. So I really think the thank you note is, whether it's digital or handwritten, doesn't make, doesn't matter as much, but I definitely think it's an important aspect. And as, as, as far as yeah. timing, same day is, is great. Um, Marlena can attest to this. I'm really bad at sending emails at like midnight or something. Don't do that for your thank you letter. You know, you don't want these people's phones to be going off because you're bugging them to thank them, right? If you don't do it before 5 uh, p.m. the same day, wait until the morning, like still write it uh, that night and then just schedule it to be sent or send it first thing in the morning so it's in there in their inbox. But certainly do not wait more than 24 hours. That's really great. Other questions? I think um, I, have a, I have a couple more. I mean, we're getting very close to the end. Um, so maybe uh, if there are any questions from the audience, please don't hesitate to, to ask. Um, I think my, I think if I were to pick one question to ask, um, it would be um, thinking about, we often talk about the application process. Um, and you know, thinking about the new hires that you've had, um, one of the things that see, seems to get talked to talked about afterwards, but I think is no less important, is what happens on that first day or first couple of weeks. What are the expectations of a new hire? Because I think that's it's the the first day is 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 always sort of like um, stereotyped as being incredibly nerve wracking. So I think finding out a little bit more about that um, can oftentimes uh, be helpful. The first day is brutal. All those federal forms that you have to fill out and make copies of all these birth certificates and all that crap, it's, it's ridiculous. It took up most of the day. <laughs> and, but the thing is, is that the, you know, getting them sitting down comfortable in what is going to be their space, so to speak, is, is probably a, you know, a critical thing to, to do early on in the process, for sure. So that they have a sense of where their space is. And, um, but it's, uh, forms aren't too bad. They're not that brutal. I mean, we can do that, right? No, they're awful. I'm with Dave. <laughs> yeah, well, have, have, you ever, have, you ever, have you ever filled out an, uh, a, an Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield application online? Okay. Yes, you win. Get it. <laughs> and every program has a, its own little idiosyncrasy. I would say that one thing, especially with the brewing industry, is that before you even go in for your first day, I would tell you to go to the tasting room and sit down and drink a beer in the tasting room as not even an employee. Just go and talk to the person that's working the tasting room and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I start next week. I just wanted to come and see what it's like because that's the time that you can't get back, but it's also it makes it a little easier when you're walking into somewhere new to be like, oh, I already know this person that works behind there. And they'll be like, hey, how, how's your, how was your weekend? Good to see you. Happy first day kind of thing. It kind of breaks the ice subtly. Um, and it also helps because you'll be drinking a beer. So that usually helps break the ice a little bit. Um, but also it just kind of shows that you're also invested a little bit more, that you're not just waiting for your first day. It's and waiting to be told what to do. It's like, I'm going to take the initiative and I'm going to show that I'm passionate, invested as well. Um, I love that. It's, it's almost like um, the, the phantom diner <laughs> type of, of deal too, <laughs> where you're doing like a little bit of user experience research. So what is it like as a customer coming in? What is, what is, what are my first impressions coming into the tasting room? You know, is, is the bar like sticky or is it a nice comfortable seat with, you know, so you, you get your kind of headset and your uh, customer 
and what, how you're providing value to, to them. And yeah, doing, do, doing, John, doing that before the interview would even be better. It's even better when it's during the interview. And, and, and just go incognito. Very I, smart. Uh, my first interview at Avery was at the bar with the quality manager drinking a beer. So the brewing industry makes interviews really, really comfortable most of the time. Uh, my interview for, for this position, I went um, with Josh, who used to be one of the brewery owners, and I was on an interview. So I was like, I can't order a beer like that. That's and he was like, she didn't even order a beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would say from back to a little bit of seriousness about first days. Um, here at Breck, this is where kind of the corporate comes into play uh, with the Anheuser-Busch. We do, for anyone who's in production, you go through a food safety training um, and then a actual safety training. Um, so our quality manager will take you through food safety. Our uh, safety manager will take you through physical safety um, and chemical safety and all of that. Um, so first day is kind of sitting in a few meetings, going through some trainings, learning, especially if you've never been in a brewery before, learning, you know, what you need to look out for and trying to keep yourself and everybody else safe um, and, and the consumer on the food safety end. So, um, and then I think it's, it's usually a lot of getting with whoever's going to be training you on what you're doing and kind of spending the day shadowing and asking questions and, and starting to get your feet wet. Um, the other part is as you start to like your first two weeks um, are always the nerve wracking ones of you, you're trying to learn the systems, you're trying to figure out your passwords for everything and all that stuff. Um, I would also say that in those time frames is make sure that you're writing down as much as possible um, because this will save you from having to go back and ask the question. Everyone will always tell you it's always better to ask the question, but it's also better to be the person that showed the initiative to begin with to write it down so you know how to do it the first time so you don't have to constantly be the person because when you're being pulled and you're waiting for your like boil to come up and you're like, I'm, I'm trying to do this. I can't talk to you right now then that employee just kind of stands there and waits and doesn't go any further. And it's uncomfortable for the employee, but it's also uncomfortable for the brewer or, or whatever. So if you take the time and then even in those time periods where you have to have that lull of like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, look back at your notes because you're going to come up with other questions that are going to pop up and stem from that. Hey, Lindsay, can you explain, you, you, you introduced uh, Marlena and John as sponsors or something. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. They're the so, troublemakers, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so um, John and Marlena, um, gosh, we met years ago. I can't remember exactly. I think through the High Tech Alliance um, and uh, Marlena um, actually has been faculty um, at teaching a professional artist class. Um, so we've met years ago and we wanted to find a way that we can bring um, employers and students together. So um, this is one thing that um, was uh, Megan Brandau um, was right in um, and our first initiative um, to, to bring the two campuses together, the, the um, Manchester and the, the Henniker campuses um, once we merged. Um, so this was uh, a way that we can kind of facilitate those connections between students and, um, and employers and, uh, and alumni in a real talk conversation. So John and Marlena have been with us um, since the very beginning. And uh, at, right at two o'clock, we started out with networking tips. And um, so they gave some fantastic advice and really kind of helped to teed off the, um, the conversation. So we're indebted to all of our employer partners to, to really come together and support our students. And, you know, as you predicted, Dave, this, um, we, the hour completely flew by and I'm just looking at the, at the clock and it's, um, and it's already gone up. And I just wanted to say what, how absolutely delightful this is. And the advice that you have given has been amazing. So I, I really appreciate you all being here and um, your time. 
I just have I have one I, I have one other little thing. Yeah. Don't to, don't expect to become a millionaire <laughs> if you're thinking seriously about joining our ranks. Um, I'll add to that is I would I would agree with that. Um, but the other thing to know is that the community, the brewing community, is the most responsive community that I've been a part of. Um, meaning that pick up the phone and call another brewery, pick up the phone and call the marketing department. And if, if whatever department you're working in within the brewery, there are, for example, in New Hampshire, there's 93 others that you can talk to. Um, and it's the least com competition based industry that you will find. Um, so the fact that you have to reach out to somebody else on how they do something or what they're doing it's not seen as a negative. It's actually seen as a way to foster and build more rapport as well as just be friends with other people that are going through the same stuff that you're going through because they're all small businesses at the end of the day and they all will either vent to you a little bit or they'll need the moment of peace to say, oh, I didn't think of that. Um, so it's a big resource out there um, just being part of, I'll say that my plug for the association is also as you go through stuff, join the associations, join the other affiliate programs that are offered. Um, they are resources. So yeah, participate, are, participate. Yep. Don't stand by the, the sidelines and wait for something. You have to be, you're only going to get as much as you give. That's amazing advice. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, cause it's like every, and every industry has it and has these professional organizations to network, but yeah, networking, net, networking is very, very, very important. I mean, we all obviously compete with one another, but the thing is, is that it's not, it's, it's, it's not a, a, a vicious competition at all. In fact, one of the things that I learned early on in this business was that the reason for that is, is that brewers in particular don't want other brewers or other breweries making bad beer. And so they're willing and able to share anything and everything they know about the beer business if you're reasonable about, reasonable about your approach to them. And uh, I, I think it's one of the, it, it's, one of the, it's one of the most interesting businesses that I've been in in my life, and I've been in several of them since I graduated from NEC in 1972. Um, but anyway, yeah, this was a pleasure doing this. Oh, I'm so happy you all joined us and um, thank you to all the participants and thank you to all the advancement team and the career and life planning team who has put so much work into this event. Um, thank you to John and Marlena um, and to all the students who have, have come and lent their, um, lent their time and, you know, your advice. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thank you.